This video is some of the notes from the Bible study on the book of Malachi, um, which I'll be reading for, from uh, throughout this little video. Uh, the book of Malachi records the events of Israel after they had returned from Babylon to the promised land. The Oracle of the Word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. The fact that this message was delivered to Israel, the people, in the land of Israel, is significant. Malachi was not a prophet to northern Israel. Malachi was not a prophet to southern Judah. Malachi was not a prophet to the exiled Jews in Babylon. Malachi's message was delivered to the Jews after God had saved them from Babylon. They were now back in Israel, the land. They could now call themselves Israel in Israel. So many of their external troubles had improved. The temple had been rebuilt and offerings had been re-established. The priests and Levites now led the people and festivals of celebration began again. But though so much of Israel's external circumstances had improved, the book of Malachi gives us insight into the thoughts running around the Israelites' heads. The people, either verbally or subconsciously, the people spoke the following words to God. How have you loved us? Verse 2. Chapter 3, verse 17. Where is the God of justice? The people speak uh, about their acts of religious devotion in the following way. What a burden. Is it futile to serve God? How have you, when God highlights the issues on their side of the relationship, the people respond defensively? How have we shown contempt for your name? How have we robbed you? Why does he, God, not regard or accept our offerings? Reading these quotes from the book of Malachi, I felt like somebody sat awkwardly between two people, such as a married couple. The little mumblings between the two point to clear tension in the relationship. The tension is not external. They're not all arguing about financial troubles. The problem is internal. They've lost love for one another. The relationship is now formal only. All love and devotion has faded and gone. Verse 2 of chapter 1. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, and I, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country, and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country, and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. A son honours his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honour? And if I am a master, where is my fear? says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, How have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, How have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not, e not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favour? Says the Lord of hosts. Israel was like a son in his thirties who removes last year's Mother's Day card out of the trash. He gets the last year's Mother's Day card out of the trash and under the pre-printed message, thanks for all you've done for me, under the pre-printed message, he adds an asterisk at the end and writes, But if you could remind me what you've done for me, 
I'll try to be more specific in my card next year. This son's gift shows a complete lack of appreciation. He's even completely ignorant of all that he's meant to be appreciative of. In much the same way, though the Israelites were going through the formalities of worshipping God, the people were buying God, they were, people were essentially buying God a you are a great God card when they celebrate. Sorry. Yes, the people were going through the formalities of worship, but the animals they offered were injured, lame, or diseased. It was as if they'd rescued their gifts out of the trash. And when God confronts them about their lack of appreciation, they question if God's ever done anything that they should ever be appreciative of. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? It's like Jurgen Klopp departing from Liverpool, saying, great weight working with you the last nine years, and then Liverpool saying to Jurgen Klopp, what have you ever done for us? If I was Jurgen Klopp, I'd have taken Liverpool back to the start, to 2014. I'd remind them that this, that, of that, that, that season, Liverpool finished the worst they'd ever finished. If it was not for Jurgen Klopp's intervention, that's probably where Liverpool would be today. In much the same way, God takes Israel back, back to their origins, and he asks them, if it were not for me, where would you be today? The descendants of Israel, Israel, the descendants of Esau. Yes, they turned out their back on me. I, uh, um, I have laid waste their hill country, but you, I have loved you. I brought you back from Babylon to the promised land. I rebuilt your, I rebuilt, helped you rebuild the ruins of Jerusalem. That's what I have done for you. But the Israelites failed to appreciate it at all. And so in verse 10, God speaks these shocking words. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors of the temple, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. It had taken 70 years, 70 years of exile to get to this point. It had taken time, effort and labour to have the temple rebuilt. But then God says he'd rather that the doors of the temple were closed. God cared nothing for Israel's formal religious devotion when the heart was absent. God cared nothing for the people's offerings when they were done without love. The same is true for us. God cares nothing for formal religious devotion. God cares nothing for the things that we do for him when they are done out of formality with a lack of love. Chapter 2, verse 1. And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honour to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring, and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. God's feeling towards the priest was communicated via the imagined or real spreading of animal dung on their faces. The dung from animal sacrifices was usually carried outside the camp and burned. It certainly had no place in God's temple. And so in smearing the dung on the faces of the priests, God was saying that they had no place in his temple. This was not for reasons of physical contamination. This was for reasons of spiritual contamination. The Israelites it, were not listening to God. Instead of listening to God's law, they taught the people whatever they wanted. And as a result, the people were being led astray. Chapter 2 verse 7. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. 
for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way, you have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. The priests, not listening, had less led to the disobedience of the people, which was the exact pattern that had caused the Israelites to be carried away to Babylon in the first place. Not listening leads to disobedience, leads to God's people being carried away. And so for that reason, it would be much better if the priests were carried away and removed first, so that a second exile did not have to occur. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. God cares nothing for formal religious devotion when the heart is absent. That's point number one. Point number two. God cares nothing for religious devotion when the lives of God's people are impure. This is 11 to 12 of chapter 2. Judah has been faithless and, um, and, and abomination, abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. These verses refer to vertical impurity. The people claimed to be worshippers of God, but their hearts were drawn more to the foreign women that they'd married and their idols. The next verse refers to horizontal impurity. God would not accept the worship of certain men because of their unloving and unfaithful actions towards their wives. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favour from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord has wit- was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. God cared nothing for the Sunday worship of these men when their lives, Monday to Saturday, were contaminated by treating their wives in this despicable way. In Malachi's day, the Israelites failed to appreciate just how concerned God was about how they lived their everyday lives outside these overtly religious activities. In much the same way, there may be areas of our lives which are not formally religious activities, which God takes issue with, because we're not living in ways that honour him. God cares nothing for religious devotion when the lives of God's people, Monday to Saturday, are impure. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. The name Malachi means my messenger. Like all the messengers who had gone before, this messenger had failed to change the direction of people's hearts, their human bias towards sin. But God promised to send another Malachi, another messenger, who would prepare the people for the coming of the Lord himself. Behold, I will send my messenger, my Malachi, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. 
after Malachi, there would be 400 years of silence when no prophet spoke. But after that 400 years, the prophet, the messenger, John the Baptist would appear. And he would appear to prepare the way for the Lord himself. The Lord himself in the person of Jesus Christ would walk on the earth. But who, who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Jesus, Jesus would have a purifying ministry when he was on earth. Like a fire purifies metals, removing, removing their impurities. Jesus would be the only one able to deal with the sinful bias of our hearts. He, he will sit as a refiner's fire, sorry, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. In Malachi, we hear how the Levites' offerings were rejected, because of the impure practices they promoted. In Malachi, we hear how the offerings of the people of Judah were not accepted because they, merely, because they were merely formal and devoid of love. But verses 3 and 4 speak of the wonderful hope that Christ would reverse these things. It is through Jesus that we are cleansed of our sin and unable to live pure lives. It is because of Jesus that our worship of God is now not formal, but instead is motivated by love. Which leads us to the last chapter, chapter 4. Throughout Malachi's four chapters, when you read what God says and then what the people say, you get a sense that the two didn't always see eye to eye, to eye to eye. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? You priests show contempt for my name, but you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? This reflects the reality of life as God's people. God may see this, but may, we may think differently. Or we may be unsure if God's statement on a matter is right. Chapter 3 records another of these instances of disagreement. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge, or of walking in his mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and escape. The people were... The people were reluctant to be open about the things they disagreed with God about. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? Sometimes being open about the things that we disagree with God can be hard. But if there's anything that Malachi teaches us, it's that God knows anyway. You ask, what have we said against you? And then say, God says, you have said. God tells the people the thoughts they'd previously been unwilling to admit to. I find it greatly reassuring that I don't need to pretend to God that I am always on the same page as him about a certain issue. Doubts, questions and uncertainties are real in the lives of God's people. But in verses 14 and 16, we see the right way to deal with these issues. When we question God in our mind, when we doubt him, or, we, or we're unsure of his faithfulness, we need to wrestle with these, these issues, like the people in verses 14 and 16. Sorry, verse 16. Then, then those who feared the law, Lord talked with each other. God's people are pictured talking with one another discussing their issues and their doubts and their questions. They're discussing them out loud. But at the end of their discussion, 
you get a sense that they'd gain greater reassurance that God is always right. God is always right that serving him is the best thing that we can do. And so they say, those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and the book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him, then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming, the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, that it will not leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from this store. The book of Malachi ends reminding us that those who persevere, persevere serving God out of love, not for malady but out of love, those who have served God in this way will have their faith, faith rewarded and their doubts proved wrong. It is never futile to serve God. Well, it's something that we'll all find out in the end.